And uh, now we're pleased to welcome from all the way from Budapest our uh, next keynote speaker, Giulio Prisco. Uh, Giulio is a writer, technology expert, futurist, and transhumanist. A former manager in uh, European science and technology centers, he writes and speaks on a wide range of topics, including science, information technology, emerging technologies, virtual worlds, space exploration, and future studies. He is especially interested in the convergence of science, technology, and spirituality. And Julia will be addressing us on the Turing Church of Transcendent Engineering. Thank you very much. As the first speaker after lunch, I guess I have to wake some of you people up, and I will do my best. I wish to thank uh, especially the organization for giving me a full half an hour. And uh, what I want to say cannot really be said in half an hour. The best I can do is to go very fast through a lot of ideas and to give you some high-level uh, impression of what I'm thinking, uh, but well, you have my email address here. If we don't have really time for any discussion, I'd like to invite everyone to send me an email, or even better, to discuss these ideas on the, MDA, on the MTA discussion list. And I'd like to dedicate this presentation to a friend, a very good friend of mine, a very good friend of many other people here, Fred uh, Chamberlain, who is the founder of Alcor. And he is now at Alcor. He is a very good friend of mine. I don't want to say he was a good friend. I want to say he is a good friend because he has only taken uh, a few decades of uh, a leave of absence. And I think and I hope he will be back with us. I don't have the time and I don't want to call for one minute of silence in the memory of Fred. Instead, I want to invite everyone to join me in a big applause to Fred Chamberlain. And also you, also you who are watching from home, I want to invite you also to join in our applause. On the T-shirt that Fred is wearing, you see, mind uploading is the ultimate out-of-body experience. Um, I'm going to talk a lot of that. I'm assuming that uh, everyone has some familiarity with concepts like mind uploading and uh, cryonics and uh, brain uh, preservation, I'm assuming everyone is. But if someone is not familiar with these things, I'd like to ask you to raise your hands. I'll do my best to give a 30 seconds introduction. I see that this is not the case. So I want to move to mind uploading. What does mind uploading mean? Um, I already said that everybody knows that. The basic uh, concept is the Turing Church conjecture, which uh, has uh, a quite complex mathematical formulation, but it basically means that what one computer can do, another computer can do. Perhaps he cannot do it that fast, perhaps you cannot, it doesn't do it exactly in the same way, but one computer can emulate another. And what we see here is a computer. This is a high-resolution uh, scan of a human uh, brain. And you can see a lot of uh, components which are familiar from computing, data processing units, and communication uh, channels between uh, different data processing units. The brain operates like a computer. Uh, I'm just going to assume that. I'm not going to uh, defend this uh, assumption. And following the Turing Church conjecture, a human mind can be transferred when we have the technology from a biological brain to another computational substrate. Now, when we have the technology, when is that going to be? As a matter of fact, it could be very soon. And this is a screenshot of uh, a talk that uh, Ken Hayward gave a few months ago, where we said, well, he said that we already have the technology to scan a human uh, brain at the required level of resolution for uh, uh, mind uploading, we need a few nanometers of accuracy. And a few nanometers of accuracy in brain readout is what we have now with the technology that we have today. Of course, we can do that 
operation on a very small section of a, a brain, but we don't really have the infrastructure to do that operationally on a large scale to offer a brain readout service in hospitals yet, but given the right uh, investment in infrastructure, this technology could come very fast. And what uh, Ken Hayward say in an interview for the New York Times is we have a cure to that right here. We have it, and we just have to make it uh, more operational than uh, what it is now. That will take some time will take a decade at least. Of course, perhaps it will take more. And uh, Fred Chamberlain knew that uh, we don't have this option as uh, an operational technology right now. So he had to do other things to ensure his own immortality. His uh, body is uh, cryonically preserved at uh, Alcor. And he dedicated a lot of his time and a lot of his attention to building a mind file. Now, what is a mind file? I am visualizing here in the first row a mind file as a sequence of uh, pictures, but also audio recordings and videos and uh, blogs, all the material that he managed to put uh, online. And he did manage to put a lot of material online. Is now stored in sites like uh, cyberev.org or uh, lifenout.com. And by the way, we have uh, uh, Gabriel uh, Rothblatt here, who is representing the TerraSame organization, which is overseeing all these uh, projects. A mind file, perhaps, is not enough. That's the reason why I'm representing it here as black and white picture. It has to be, does it work better like that? It has to be. Uh, augmented with other data that may come, of course, from uh, the chemical signature in uh, a frozen body. I'm representing here in uh, color all other information that we may need to complete the mind file of Fred Chamberlain until we can achieve a color signature here. And uh, that is going to be an emulation of uh, a Fred which is going to be good enough to be acceptable by everyone. First of all, of course, himself and his wife, Linda. And we all look forward to meeting Fred again. Uh, just go to the Therasen websites for more information. Now, the mind file is going to be incomplete. And with the technology that we have right now, even if I dedicated most of my time to building my own mind file, I would never have the time to store on computer memory all the things that are biologically encoded in my brain to make myself me. And that is a problem, but we don't have to store it all, perhaps. For example, here you can see one of uh, the first homes that I can remember. I must have been about five years old at that time. And uh, I don't really remember that much. I don't have that many visual memories of this home. For example, I know that uh, somebody took me to the school bus the other side of the road. Even if I cannot remember, I can go to Google Maps, I can activate Street View. And when I'm there, I have a full three-dimensional virtual reality recording and a walkthrough of the area that I used to know as a child. And uh, so I don't need to keep within my mind file a visual record of the environment that I saw around me when I was a kid because that visual record is already stored in the cloud. And whatever future artificial intelligence system will have to uh, augment my mind file with other information to reconstruct myself, the, it will be able to find this information in the cloud. That as far as visual memories are concerned. This is uh, another of the homes where I lived when I was a kid. I lived in many places. Uh, we don't only have visual memories in uh, the cloud, but also other. For example, my mother language is uh, Italian. That was the main language that I heard when I was uh, five to ten years old. Now, suppose I cannot uh, preserve the knowledge of my first language in my mind file. Uh, that would be a much of a problem because once native language is a central 
part of his personality, of course. But also, that information is available in the cloud. We have uh, plenty of information about written and spoken Italian language. So I think future MindFile revival systems will be able to uh, graft this uh, information onto me as an external subsystems. And I think, uh, mm, I'm sure I have given the idea, future AI system will be able to fill the gaps in our mind files with a lot of available data. So that I definitely look forward to the revival of uh, today's mind files. But I also agree on the fact that uh, this perhaps is not enough as a personality preservation system, as, as uh, uh, Gabriel said in his article on IET, uh, we really need to have multiple backup strategy, including cryonics presentation, including in the future uh, chemical brain preservation and so on. The result will be that something will be able to reconstruct our memories. And this is one of the reasons why there are some authors who think uh, of transhumanism as a religion. I was not sure of uh, the title I wanted to give to this slide. Perhaps I wanted to say transhumanism is a religion, but perhaps that would be too strong a statement. Uh, I think we can uh, safely assume that transhumanism can be interpreted as a religion and can, be, can give people uh, a good subset of the mental benefits that religion gives. This is a very good book written by a friend of Manhattan College in New York, Robert Gerasi. I hope he's listening to us now. Uh, with uh, a defense of the interpretation of transhumanism as a modern religion. As a matter of fact, this is one of the memories I have when I started reading the Extropy List in the 90s. Uh, the first thing I thought was, okay, this uh, looks like a religion, and it looks like a very powerful new religion for the new millennium. Uh, I wrote that to the Extropy List, and uh, some of the replies that I got uh, were what you can very easily imagine. But I did also get some uh, at least uh, interested replies. And I'm happy to see that even if we are still a very small subset of the transhumanist community, there are more and more uh, people who share our uh, uh, interpretation of transhumanism as something, in some sense, like a religion. And I want to talk now of the religion of Richard Dawkins. Now, everyone knows who Richard Dawkins is. Everyone knows that Richard Dawkins is uh, the a champion of the new atheist, someone who has been uh, sometimes uh, very passionately against religion. But what he's saying here is that it's highly plausible that in the universe there are godlike uh, for example, alien civilization that have attained superhuman uh, power that we, from our perspective, could only call God. Oh my God, that uh, looks like exactly the sort of religion that I believe in. This looks like the, the religion that we believe in. He's even uh, considering the possibility that our reality may be computed by a higher level of reality. Well, uh, this is what we are saying here in all our talks today. He is assuming that there is nothing supernatural in that. He's thinking that these uh, godlike uh, creators that may exist in the universe and may have computationally created our reality, they must have uh, been uh, evolved like us from uh, biological uh, organisms. And he sees that as just one very advanced stage of Darwinian evolution. And I do find, uh, I must say that I'm not a member of the church. Most of you know that. I know just a little bit about the church, but that looks like some of uh, what Joseph Smith wrote. And this is one of the reasons why I was very attracted by the MTA in the first place. By the way, he wrote uh, this in a book called The God Delusion, but perhaps he doesn't think that it is such a delusion after all. He's saying the same thing that uh, Arthur Clarke said. But Arthur Clarke was not the first, because William Shakespeare was the first to say that there are more things in heaven and earth that uh, your philosophy contemplates. 
And another who said similar things in a very nice way is Ray Kurzweil in the age of spiritual machines. When he discussed what's going to happen of the universe is going to continue to expand, if it's going to shrink until a big uh, a crunch. He thinks that is not re- necessarily written in the laws of physics, but it may be a decision that we, ourselves, will have to make when the time is right. So he's considering the possibility that we may evolve to such godlike uh, powers that we will be able to rewrite the laws of physics. And what I say is, uh, why not? I hope so. That will be a very beautiful future to live in. And I hope to be revived in such a future. Could you just speak a little closer to the mic? So I'll try to. I hope you guys from home are listening to me. Now, I mentioned Fred Chamberlain. I want to mention also another person. This is my mother. She died in uh, 2001, more than 10 years ago. And she is not cryonically preserved anywhere. She didn't leave a mind file behind. Uh, She's just in a cemetery. So what uh, it it would be very natural to think is that my mother is real dead, 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 dead forever, without any backup. Of course, I don't like to think that. We also like to think that the people that we loved, who died before uh, some uh, very advanced and science fiction-like technology that we have today, we like to think that we can see them again. Living forever is not enough. Immortality is not enough. I really think that science and technology will advance to the point where uh, we will be able to become an immortal species, but that is not enough. Why is it not enough? Because I want to see my mother again. Because you want to see, again, some uh, people that, uh, according to the conventional wisdom, are dead and are gone forever. A religion, in order to be successful, mimetically successful, in order to be strong, in order to be something that people can really believe in, must offer resurrection besides immortality, and it must offer it through science and technology, according to my point of view, at least. This is the principle of universal immortalism, to restore to life all persons who have ever lived, whether they had been preserved or not. I hope uh, to hear from uh, uh, Mike later more about universal immortalism. Nobody said that better than Joseph Smith. If I have no expectation of seeing my father, mother, brothers, sisters, and friends again, my heart would burst in a moment, and I should go down to my grave. That's what we really need religion for. It's not the only reason, but I think it's the strongest. We cannot bear the heartache of life, of knowing that we will never see again the persons that we loved. This is what, uh, this hope is what anything that wants to call itself a religion must uh, be able to offer us. And that's why we're talking today of uh, transcendent engineering. Say things like we will develop space-time engineering and scientific future magic much beyond our current understanding and imagination. And by using this future magic, we will be able to do things like, for example, resurrect the dead by coping them to the future. This is a part of a short article called Ten Cosmic Convictions that I wrote with Ben Gersel a few years ago and who are in uh, his uh, book titled The Cosmist Manifesto. And I wish to recommend reading this book to everyone. And again, the prophet Joseph Smith said the same things. Uh, when I was preparing this presentation, I was not sure what citation I wanted to include from Joseph Smith about theosis, the idea that uh, God was once like us, and we may become one day like God. Uh, I'd like to have your opinion where the citation that I have uh, inserted here is a good one. If you know of a better one, I'd like to know it. So just get in touch with me. Thank you very much. Is on the MTA side. There is a very good uh, uh, repository of citations and quotes. Another philosophy that is very much related to what uh, I am saying, to what we are saying here today, is uh, Russian 
cosmism, and this was uh, a Christian transhumanist philosophy originated uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Now, there is a documentary done by the BBC last year uh, about uh, Russian cosmism and uh, its role as a precursor of all the Russian scientific development in the 20th century and the Russian space uh, program. In fact, Konstantin Silovsky, the father of the Russian space program, was a cosmist. The documentary is called, uh, is called Knocking at Heaven's Door. Um, it was aired last year, and, uh, well, okay, I'm not supposed to say that, but if you are into these things, you can very easily find it on the file-sharing sites. And I recommend to everyone watching this uh, documentary, Unity Between Man and the Cosmos, Humanity's Destiny to Leave the Earth and Colonize the Universe, and also Technological Resurrection, that's from another uh, Russian cosmic philosopher that I'm going to mention later. These are the cornerstones of what uh, can be a transhumanist religion. Now, I don't, want, I don't want to say it like that. These are the cornerstones of our transhumanist religion. Uh, mind uploading, say that we can make a copy of uh, the self, which is biologically encoded in the brain, and we can re-implement it, re-instantiate it something else. Uh, we think that uh, future science and technology will also develop some magic technology that now we used to call uh, mind uh, time scanning and sometimes quantum archaeology to reach back in the past, acquire high-resolution information from the past in such a way as to become able to reconstruct exactly what's going on in the biological brain of a person alive now and re-instantiate this uh, uh, person in the future, we may wake up in the future. We may wake up in uh, the real reality, or perhaps we may wake up in a virtual reality. Perhaps our descendants, when they choose to resurrect us, we choose to implement us in one of their uh, virtual worlds. We could be living in a simulated universe right now. Uh, I cannot demonstrated, but uh, is a possibility comparable with what we know about science and technology today. We are perhaps already there. Now, what happens in a simulated universe? This has been described, for example, by Hans Moravec. If you read between the lines of some of the things that Hans Moravec has written, you find that he takes uh, this uh, option very seriously, and he thinks that uh, we may be reconstructed in the mind of a superhuman uh, de uh, descendant, or we may be living in the mind of a superhuman entity right now. And he's not the first one to say this. Bishop George Berkeley said that uh, a few centuries ago. We may be thoughts in a transcendent mind, the mind that uh, George Berkeley used to call the supreme and wise spirit in whom we live, move, and have our being. That's George Berkeley's uh, God, and we may be thoughts in the mind of God. We're saying the same things that has been say, have been said for centuries. Of course, we are saying them in different words, based on the understanding of scientific reality that we have uh, developed in the 21st century. Now, we're talking of simulation. Let's see a very simple simulated universe. This is the, generated by the Game of Life of John Conway. It's an extremely simple universe. You know, each uh, cell is updated in real time according to the state of the surrounding cells. It's a very simple cellular automata. In this simulation, I have a, there is an oscillator here. This thing in the bottom is an oscillator that just does like this. This is a, a glider, is a structure that in this simulated universe is going to move like this. And what's going to happen is that at some point this oscillator will die because it will be destroyed by the glider. These are the laws of physics of this very simple simulated universe. Okay, let's go back in time. 
uh, hold on, go back in time. That's not possible. And in fact, the laws of physics of the life universe are not reversible in time. I cannot reconstruct uh, the state of the system in the past from the state of the system now. So this is really a miracle. We have an angel here and he has uh, done a miracle. Uh, these laws of physics are not reversible, but I am running this simulation. This is my own universe. I can keep as many backup as I want. These backups are not done within the physics of the life universe, but I'm doing them in my own level of reality. I have kept all the snapshots that I keep as backup. Uh, the simulators may be creating new snapshot of uh, our minds and ourselves right now. So I'm back at the first instance of time. I have flipped a bit. I have changed the status of a cell in a way that is incompatible with these laws of physics, but I can do it because I'm running this simulation. You install a life simulator and you can do it yourself. If you are running a simulated universe with its own simulated physics, you can, from your level of reality, do something that goes against the laws of physics of your simulated universe. That's what we call a miracle. In fact, now we have an angel who has done a miracle. And the oscillator is safe. What's going to happen if I continue to run the si sim simulation is that this uh, glider will die and the oscillator will continue to oscillate forever. It will be an immortal oscillator. This is the concept that I want to insist on. I don't believe in supernatural. Uh, whatever happens, happens within the laws of physics. But if our universe is a simulation that is being computed in a higher level of reality, those who are running the simulation, of course they cannot violate the laws of physics of their reality, but if they choose, they can violate the laws of physics in our reality, because our reality is a computed reality from their point of view and they have full control. This is a, I mean, I have said that I don't believe in supernatural, but now I'm saying that I believe that maybe there is such a thing as supernatural. So I have uh, thrown supernatural out of the main door. Now I have thrown supernatural out of the back door, but now it's coming back to the main door of science. There are scientific explanation of uh, a supernatural reality, of what we, from our limited perspective, would call a supernatural reality. Let's talk of this concept of quantum archaeology, of uh, time scanning, to go back in the past and get information from the past. Does everybody understand why I have uh, uh, a cat here? I have a stone cat. It was in a temple. I don't really remember where it was, but I thought it was very appropriate. Does everyone understand why we have a cat here? I'm referring to the Schrodinger cat, of course. We are going to talk of the Schrodinger cat. Okay. What is quantum archaeology? I wanted to give a loose definition is a, a set of hypothetical far future technology. They may be related to quantum effects because everything is related to quantum effects. And this set of technology will permit reconstructed uh, the past with such a accuracy and resolution to reconstruct human beings by copying them to the future. And the question I'm, I'm asking myself is, is this feasible or not? Of course, we cannot do now. But is this something that can be done, can be envisaged, can be imagined by future science and uh, that can be done by future technology? Uh, I think yes. And hopeful by nature. Another very hopeful person was uh, the other uh, Russian cosmist philosopher, Nikolai Fyodorov, who common a task is to resurrect from eternal life every being mundane by death and time. He envisaged 
scientific resurrection. Now, something that I want to say is that he was a Christian, and the, the Russian cosmic philosophy uh, emerged from uh, Russian Orthodox Christianity, um, which is very similar to what uh, the MTA is doing within the Mormon religion. Uh, perhaps the LDS uh, uh, doctrine is especially fertile uh, uh, ground for the emergence of uh, transhumanist ideas. But that has happened many times in the past, and I think we have example within any major religion. Science is not the enemy of religion. On the contrary, science and religion can uh, speed up each other and uh, mutually reinforce each other. I'm really persuaded of that. Now, how did Nikolai Fyodorov think that we could be reconstructed in the future? He wrote uh, something like, you know, we, the laws of physics say that we can follow the evolution of every particle back in time. So it's just enough to find uh, the atoms that uh, constituted a particular a person who just have to put all these atoms together again. That sounds very naive, given what we know of how the universe works. That sounds very naive now, um, but of course, Fyodorov was speaking, uh, given the science of his time, uh, we have more advanced science, and we can imagine perhaps something better. And first, we have to ask ourselves the question, is the universe deterministic and reversible? Uh, if it is, then we can reconstruct the past. Now, as far as the answer to this question is concerned, everyone knows that the answer is yes, and everyone knows that the answer is no. Uh, I'm not going to detail, of course, I'm assuming everyone understands. If we don't take into account uh, thermodynamics, then the laws of non-quantum physics are fully deterministic and reversible in time. So in principle, we could do something like what Fyodorov envisaged. It's just going to be very difficult from a technological point of view. Just going to need a better screwdriver to do that. That's what Frank Tibler thinks in his omega point theory. He thinks that uh, with uh, some techniques that uh, I don't have the time to describe, and perhaps that is even better because I would not be able to describe, nobody would be. Uh, our descendants in the far future may be able to reconstruct and uh, inject in their reality or in a simulated reality every person who ever lived. Uh, I'm not going to read of the, all that, and um, I have many articles on my website about the omega point. After that, we may wake up in a simulated environment with many of the features assigned to the afterlife world by the major religions. How can we do quantum archaeology in practice? Now we talk of extra-dimensional connection between every point in space-time to every other point in space-time. If this point in space-time has multiple connection to this point in space-time uh, in another uh, place and another time, if every space-time pixel is somehow connected to every other space-time uh, pixel, then we may become able to extract enough information from any location in space-time to do quantum archaeology and reconstruct every person who ever lived. And perhaps that has to do with quantum physics. Well, since everything has something to do with quantum physics, I would be surprised if quantum archaeology did not have anything to do in qu with quantum physics. That's why we call it quantum archaeology. Can I explain quantum archaeology? No. Richard Feynman said something very right more than 50 years ago. Nobody understands quantum mechanics. Nobody understood quantum mechanics 50 years ago. How many people understand the quantum mechanics today? How many people in the audience understand quantum mechanics? I don't. I think nobody understands quantum mechanics now. Uh, what the blip do we know? The, I think many people have seen this film, which is very much uh, criticized as uh, 
a very low level explanation of quantum physics mixed with so many other things, parapsychology, holistic theories. But I'm telling you, I am a physicist. I have uh, watched what the blip. The explanation of the physics is good. The correlation with other things are perhaps more uh, questionable, but the physics in what the blip is good. This is their uh, picture of the double slit experiment. Uh, what do these experiments say? That uh, there are no things. Here I have a coin, but in reality it's, uh, it's not a coin. I perceive this as a coin. It's a superposition of many things that I cannot even imagine. It's a superposition of all these things that I'm representing as dots on the screen. There are no things and no things exist in a superposition of possible states. This is what quantum physics say. Now, what happens when we look at things? When we look at things, we make uh, many potential reality disappear but one. And the reality crystallizes and collapses from being a nothing to being what we call a thing. This is one possible interpretation of what the equations of quantum physics say. Of course, uh, uh, who is the observer? This uh, guy comes from the fringe, serious. But you know, does, is the observer always a human being? Is, uh, is a mouse an observer? Is uh, uh, a computer an admissible observer? I think the answer to these questions is yes, but not everyone agrees. And uh, the example of the Schrödinger uh, cat is very usually given to show the weirdness of uh, quantum indetermination when it becomes amplified to a macroscopic level through a suitable experimental setup. If we lock the cat in a box with a radioactive atom that has 50% uh, probability of uh, decaying, uh, triggering a device that will uh, destroy the cat, then all that we can say before opening the box is that uh, the cat is, uh, doesn't look like a cat because it's a superposition of a dead cat and an alive cat. Of course, I'm oversimplifying, but I believe most of the people of the audience know these things very well. The cat is in a superposition of states. What happens when someone opens the box? According to the well-known Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, the very act of uh, looking by an observer uh, causes the collapse of the wave function. So while before the observation, the state of the system was a superposition of a dead cat and an alive cat, the observer has collapsed the wave function and the state of the system becomes either a cat alive or a cat dead. Uh, and this means that uh, information is lost. And the universe is not deterministic. Nobody knows what we will see when we open the box. So it may seem that uh, quantum physics does not have the nice uh, features of classical physics. It is not deterministic and it is not reversible. We cannot recalculate the universe back in time and we cannot do anything like quantum archaeology. There are other interpretations of quantum physics. In what is called Everett's many worlds interpretation of quantum physics, there is no collapse of the wave function and there is no irretrievable and irreversible loss of information. What happens when uh, uh, quantum reality unfolds is that the universe splits. It splits in many universes. In one of these universes, uh, the cat is uh, dead and the observer will remember having seen the cat dead. In another universe, the cat will be alive and the observer will also remember having seen the cat alive. Universes split and the observers split as well.
It's something weird that we cannot imagine. And of course, the many world interpretation is called interpretation because there is no experimental way to demonstrate it. It's just one of the many possible ways in which we can interpret uh, quantum physics. Of course, I cannot demonstrate that uh, the MWIs are true, but I can consider it as something that may well be the case by thinking about reversible computing. Uh, it is a discovery of modern com uh, emerging science called physics of computation that an efficient computer is a reversible computer. Uh, the act of destroying information uh, requires uh, an expenditure of energy that has to come from somewhere. So the most efficient computation are uh, reversible computation, and it can be demonstrated that uh, every irreversible computation can be embedded in a reversible computation, like the simple logic uh, a gate here. is an end gate which is embedded in uh, something which is completely reversible called the Toffoli gate. Any irreversible computation may be transformed into a reversible one by embedding it into a larger computation where no information is lost. Now, let's think of some high-level uh, uh, principle. It is not a very standard way of doing science because I'm beginning from a very, very high level and I'm going down to a low level to say something about how the universe works. A useful high-level principle, for example, is that the universe is the fastest computer is the fastest computer that computes itself. If I want to know the weather that uh, we will have here uh, tomorrow with very high accuracy, we can, I cannot do that in less than 24 hours. The, see, the fastest way to compute the future is to wait for the future to unfold. I think this... Um, is a uh, very good uh, principle because it kind of uh, provides uh, an ex a justification of uh, free will within a deterministic universe. If the universe is deterministic, many people say, okay, I don't like that because it means I don't have free will. But if there is no way that you can uh, forecast what uh, you will do tomorrow faster than waiting and seeing what you will do tomorrow, then I think uh, in some sense of the world, we do have free will. And it can be also seen as related to the problem of evil. Why does God permit the existence of evil? Well, if God has to act within the laws of physics, and if the laws of physics do not permit to know within arbitrary detail the future in advance, then God himself cannot know. And uh, he has to allow the existence of evil because there is nothing else that he can do. This is an example of application of a high-level principle. And applying this other high-level uh, principle that reality must be optimally energy efficient, then we can conclude that our universe must be embedded into a reversible computation. And this reversible computation can be the multiverse of average many word interpretation. What does that all mean? It means that reality is more complex than we see. We see a reality with a cat. We see the Schrodinger cat here. But what we see is a shadow. And perhaps the source of the shadow is not a cat. Looks more like a dog to me. Can be something <laughs> even stranger than that. So we could be multi persons ourselves. And uh, this concept has also been mentioned, I believe, by Chris in one of uh, the morning's presentation. Some kind of multi dimensional concept of self. We may be shadows of something else that exists in a higher level of reality. And we may be projecting shadows here. But the source of the shadow is something else. Now, what I like to think is that assume that uh, I am a shadow. 
of something else. Now, it makes sense to think that the source of the shadow must be much more complex than the shadow itself. I am very complex because I'm thinking. If uh, the source of the shadow, which is me, has to be more complex than me, it, means this, uh, it must be a conscious being. So perhaps we are uh, lower, lower dimensional shadows of higher dimensional conscious being who are thinking uh, some kind of thoughts, but uh, their thoughts would be much more complex than whatever we can think. I don't have time to go in detail. There is an article that I wrote with, uh, together with uh, writer Richard Miller. Hello, Richard, if you're listening to us. He's on my website. It's called Shadows and the Concept of Self. Now, how can we really use all these things? I'm sure you have all heard of quantum entanglement. If uh, two particles have interacted, perhaps they have a common uh, origin, then uh, you move one here to Earth and you place one somewhere else. What happens? Uh, common sense says that they are two completely different and two completely separated things with no possibility of interacting. But uh, quantum physics implies that there is some kind of instant correlation between any set of uh, particles that have interacted in the past, even if uh, they are out of each other light cones. Even if there is no way that one particle can send a signal to the other at lower than the speed of life, uh, the speed of light, there are some instantaneous correlation that can be experimentally verified. And actually this has been experimentally verified since 1982. And this is uh, the example that uh, I like to give. It's like having uh, uh, magic coins. Here is one. It is a magic coin. I give another magic coin to my friend. I stay here on Earth. My friend goes to Jupiter. And uh, the magic coins work like that. When we flip the coin, we get correlated results. Head and tail, or head and head. But we always get correlated results. And that's, what, uh, that's not only what the mathematics of uh, quantum mechanics say it will happen. It is also what it has been experimentally verified. It happens, and it always happens. Entanglement is uh, that completely spoiled the effect that I want to do. <laughs> Let me do that again because it's important. Okay, now it works. There are instantaneous correlation between things at very separate locations in space. And as a matter of fact, quantum entanglement has been also uh, theoretically justified very recently, 2011, that it can be happen also in time. Now, I have to say that there is no way that we can see to use this instantaneous quantum entanglement correlation to actually send a message from here to there. And why? Uh, because the flip, of the, the flip of the coin is random. It's not something that I can control. And as uh, quantum mechanics says, if uh, I control it, then I lose all the quantum effects, including entanglement itself. But the correlations are there. The correlations are there. This can be theoretically and experimentally verified. So what happens is that uh, we can have identical random streams at different locations in space-time. It doesn't mean that I can send a message from here to there. Uh, one of these uh, space-time uh, pixels may be here in Salt Lake City on April 6, 2012, and the other can be on another uh, galaxy in another moment of time without any possibility to send a signal according to the laws of physics at less than the speed of light. The correlations are there, so we can have identical random streams at different locations in space-time, but it's a, that is exactly what we need to run two identical computation at two separate locations without any need of sending a signal from one location to the other. But what I think uh, it makes sense uh, as a possibility is that having identical random strings could be enough to reconstruct something that has happened in another place and another time.
That's nothing like a rigorous uh, demonstration, of course. But I think uh, quantum physics gives us uh, suggesting evidence for all that. And for the idea that we had flatlanders, we live in a lower dimensional world. How long time do I have? One minute, two, three? Oh, well, that's more than enough. Okay, we're flatlanders. This is, uh, I am this guy here. I live in a flatland. I live in a two-dimensional universe. From my point of view, this uh, two-dimensional universe is reality. But what this guy is telling me is, uh, look, my friend, okay, you are happy with your reality, but there is so much of the real reality, there is so much of my reality that you do not see. This is what modern science is telling us. Uh, we don't know enough to describe what lies beyond our reality, but as a students of modern physics, we know that uh, the reality that we can perceive is just a very small subset of a much bigger reality. And of course, that's again what uh, William Shakespeare said. There are more things in heaven and earth that we can even imagine at this stage of our evolution. Sometimes we, or someone else, may develop the science and the technology to go out of flat land and see the wider universe that is out there. A hand may lift us from flat land into a higher level reality. And the question that I ask myself is whose hand is this? Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Whenever I give this kind of talk, somebody asks me whether I believe. And uh, I'm used to give uh, very, how to say it, very, very intellectual answers. I know that may be different over here, but uh, a European intellectual cannot say I believe in God. It's not, uh, it's not allowed. It has, to say, uh, it has to say perhaps it can, but it uh, has to use many more words. Okay? Well, I guess I do, but however, okay, and I continue talking for half an hour. I cannot answer with just one word. That means uh, the answer is very complex, and if you expect a simple answer, that means you're not smart enough to understand the complex answers. Uh, I gave a talk a few months ago, and uh, a lady asked me, do you believe the answer I gave at that time is, well, uh, the answer is more yes than no. That perhaps is a step in the right direction. I am a scientist, and I subscribe to a materials worldview. And as a matter of fact, I am a scientist, and I do subscribe to a materialist worldview. I don't think anything is supernatural. I think it's a contradiction in terms. Why? Because if we describe nature as everything that exists, then, of course, something that uh, uh, is not a part of nature cannot exist. It's logic, it's not science. It's just how we use language. And, in fact, I am a scientist, and I subscribe to a materialist worldview. At the same time, at the same time I have just given you this talk, it's very evident that I do believe in something, and it's very evident that we here in this uh, hall, and I hope many of the people watching us, have a shared uh, belief in something. Perhaps it's not the same thing for everyone, but we do believe in something. So I think I'm going to give a much simpler answer the next time somebody asks me whether I believe. I think my simple answer is going to be yes, I do. Thank you very much. Time for any questions? Um, 
Um, when you were talking about the resurrection and the quantum archaeology of means of finding, or, or even before that, um, finding past loved ones to bring back, and that's how we'll eventually resurrect everyone. What are, are you ascribing to that? Um, that in the future, I mean, for people, that it's very, very difficult to get data on people who uh, lived many, many thousands of years ago and barely left a trace so that we can record with our current technology. What will be the driver for finding them? Will it be the series of loved ones wanting their fathers and their fathers and their fathers? Or what, what will be that human motivator to keep finding these people and bringing them back? Right. Thank you very much. So the question is, uh, why should our descendants uh, bother to resurrect us? I believe that's the gist of what you mean. And uh, I think there are many possible answers. For example, Frank uh, Tipler says that at some point, uh, before the omega point, the amount of computing uh, power which is, will be available to our descendants will diverge to infinity. So at some point, it will be so easy for them to resurrect us that they will do it as uh, they will do a very minor routine thing. They don't even need a justification to resurrect us. They may do it just for fun because it's very easy to do. That's the answer of Frank Tibler. Uh, now, I don't think that we will have to wait until the very end of the universe and until the availability of infinite computing uh, power for technological resurrection. I think that might be achieved by some future technology much before that time. So it's not going to be extremely easy for them, and they will need some reason to resurrect people in the past. But I think the reason that you mentioned is a very good one. I mean, I resurrect my uh, parents because I love them and I want to see them again. Now, once they have been resurrected, of course, they want to resurrect their parents because they love them. So the reason to resurrect people from the past is very simple, is love. No other questions, I guess? I think everyone has my uh, email address, and I look forward very much to continuing the discussion on uh, the MTA mailing list.